Hi, this is Peter Alvin from Big Brother and the Holy Company on the show here with Ray Shasso interviewing the legends. Hello once again everyone, I'm your host Ray Shasho and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends brought to you by the Rockstar Chronicles Series 1. It's my new book and it features over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know. It's available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Had it not been for the melodic and accomplished guitar work of Peter Albin flowing out of an upper story window at 1090 Page Street in the early summer of 1965, there might not have been a big brother in the holding company. It was on that day that Sam Andrew happened down Page Street in San Francisco and was so impressed by what he heard that he went in and introduced himself. By the time Peter met Sam in 1965, he had aspirations of forming a band that would write and perform children's songs. One of the first songs he wrote while working with children at the Marin Jewish Community Day, uh, Day Camp north of San Francisco was Caterpillar. This song went on the, uh, to appear on the first Big Brother and the Holding Company album. But the guitarist who inspired the first with Sam Andrew ended up making the transition to bass and has spent most of his career with that instrument. Although his fine guitar work can be heard on cuts such as Cuckoo, Oh, Oh, uh, Sweet Mary, and Turtle Blues, and on Big Brother's LP, Be a Brother, and How Hard It Is. A witty and personable, Peter provided much of the onstage commentary and served as the liaison for the group with managers and promoters. Also, in the early days of Big Brother before Janice, Peter did most of the lead vocals for the band. Among the many songs he sang were Blow My Mind and down on me. Even after Janice, the first album finds Peter's lead on Blind Man, later is fast, faster than sound and Caterpillar. Peter's musical pursuits have also extended beyond Big Brother and the Holding Company. He has played with Country Joe and the Fish and can be heard on their 1969 Vanguard album, Here We Are Again. He later toured in an all-star band with Joe McDonald that cut an album outside Paris in September of 72. In 1982, Peter was one of the founding members of the Bay Area supergroup, The Dinosaurs. Along with Peter, the group consisted of John Cipollini, Barry Melton, uh, Merle Saunders, Robert Hunter, and Spencer Dryden. Peter has loaned many items to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum in Cleveland. The most notable piece is his legendary psychedelic Fender Jazz bass from 1968, which is now a popular museum attraction. Please welcome co-founder, singer, songwriter, musician for Big Brother and the Holding Company, the group that launched the career of Janis Joplin, Peter Albin, to interviewing the legends. Hello there, Peter. Well, hello, you, Ray, and everybody that's listening to you. You got, you got an orchestra in your background of, of birds, which sounds pretty cool. I, I feel like I'm in the tropical oh, forest. Yeah. <laughs> what, they are... They are uh... Away. That's your family, huh? But, uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope it doesn't interrupt the uh, interviews very much. Oh, I just but, uh, it, it is kind of you know, it, it tweet, you know, very sweet kind of background music. Well, I feel like I'm in the tropical uh, forest, so that's it's kind of cool, actually. There you go. <laughs> you you um, when did you first? What did you think of Janis Joplin when you first met her? Ray, you're breaking up. Hmm. Well, that was quick. I can hear you. Uh, w can you hear me now? I can. Okay. <laughs> you started a sentence and it just disappeared. Oh, okay. What What did you first think of Janis Joplin when you first met her? Well, uh, first met her during the folk period uh, at a radio station called uh, KPFA. And the program was Midnight Special. And everybody was sitting around in a big circle with one microphone in the middle and... Uh, trading off songs and uh, she was sitting next to me that's the first time I, I heard her she was just by herself playing guitar and, and singing blues to, uh, tunes old kind of folk blues type, type right. stuff and she was an extremely strong singer and uh, I said hmm get to watch this gal and my brother who was uh, uh, a uh, director of the folk music festivals at San Francisco State College 
he uh, hired her and a couple guys to back her up, and she never showed. So it was kind of, huh. kind of strange. But we did uh, see her at the coffee gallery, which was a place in North Beach, in the old picnic days, uh, singing solo, and uh, she was extremely strong. And uh, I said, wow. <laughs> Hmm, better remember this person. And uh, so we did, you know. I, I, I locked her in my brain, you know, and when we, when we started thinking about other singers besides myself for the band, um, I thought immediately of Janice. And uh, Chet Helms, who was our manager, uh, said, well, she, I was the guy that brought her up to San Francisco in the first place. In right. In 63, I'll, I'll phone a friend of mine and see if he can bring her up to back to San Francisco because she had a tough time uh, just for the first couple of years that she was here and she went back to uh, <coughs> Port Arthur because uh, her friends got her a one-way ticket back they, they didn't think that she was doing so well right. she got involved in drugs and alcohol and whatever and uh, I think she needed to go back home and her friends thought so too when she went back she went to school uh, for about a year uh, I think her mother ran a, a business uh, college, and she was learning how to, to do um, various, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, you know, uh, oof, I'm losing my words, uh, ledgers and right. accounting and that sort of thing. What, what was her family uh, life like? You know, you always wonder, you know, when you get into drugs and things like that, I, I had... I partied a lot, you know, not not as much probably as Janice, but I had my moments, and all my friends did, and, uh, you know, my, actually, my dad was an alcoholic, so I, I'm not sure if that kind of derived from that, because I could never talk to him at night, he was, you know, always out of it, but what was Janice, what, what, was there, you think there's any reasons that might have sparked her into getting into drugs like that, or? That's a good question. I, I really don't know what, what got her got her into drugs. I know she had a, a kind of a tough uh, adolescent period. Right. Um, she wasn't the most attractive gal in, in uh, high school, had, had an acne problem. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, she was, I think, at, in uh, the University of Texas at Austin. She was voted uh, ugliest, ugliest man on campus. That's horrible. Which was horrible. That's the whole thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, she she had problems, and uh, uh, I think drinking start. You know, that's what she started on. I think drinking a lot of booze in uh, in and around uh, Austin. And when she came out to San Francisco, it, it turned into speed. Uh, you know, methadrine, and uh, and occasionally uh, heroin. But it was mostly speed that she was on, and, and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a downfall in a lot, with a lot of folks that, that we knew. Oh, yeah, especially in San Francisco, and also during the psychedelic days, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, even then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a tough period, you know? I remember, I remember them well, you know? I was a 60s guy, you know? Yeah. But, you know, I, I always thought she was uh, very cute, you know. I thought she was very, very cute. I thought Janice was uh, a good looker, you know. She, she had a nice figure and everything, you know. I, it's, that's terrible what they said about her, though. That, that, that would stay with you for a long time. I, I could see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrible stuff. So uh, she had this complex, you know. And yeah. she, she really wanted to be, you know, um, uh, well known. I mean, she always looked to that, you know, uh, like other girls that she knew that, that were kind of popular. And not saying that she wanted to be a, you know, popular girl on campus, but she wanted to be accepted. And, and uh, she wasn't a lot of times in 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 most of of the college groups, I guess, or cliques. So she became kind of an outcast and started going to different places where outcasts would go and uh, mm. start uh, singing and, and uh, uh, playing guitar and auto harp um, and, and listening to a lot of uh, uh, black musicians. Right. And sometimes she'd, she'd go out with black guys in, in the South. That was like a no-no in right. the early 60s. 
Yeah. That was another thing that kind of, uh, you know, she was an outsider. Mm-hmm. But um, she became very popular. <laughs> yes, she so. did. But you know, you guys were a good. You you guys were an incredible band. I you guys don't get enough kudos because you know I loved your psychedelic sound. Uh, you know, if, if if you weren't a good band, Janice wouldn't have been there in in the forefront. I know a lot of people mentioned later that. Um, you, they should have had uh, studio musicians on albums, and you guys weren't as good as you know they they wanted you guys to be. Um, I thought that was all BS, man. I thought you guys were a very solid band. I thought you were good, very very good. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, we we tried our best, you know. Uh, on the Chief Thrills record, uh, John John uh, Simon, who who didn't sign his name, right. his producer, who did produce it. The record, you know, was was frustrated with us because he had dealt with studio musicians as a producer, you know, and and they could like lay down a track, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe in two or three takes. Where every time we started playing the song, the same song, we could kind of do it differently. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, um, I thought, you know, that's what we're we were supposed to do. We were supposed to like be inventive, you know, and, and not play the same line the same way all, sure. all the time. Sure. So that's not the way he, he felt, you know. You're not you're not being a good studio musician that way. And and, you, and Albert Grossman, the uh, mm-hmm. our illustrious manager at the time, felt the same way. As a matter of fact, he um, took. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say we did some live recording in, in uh, Detroit, the Grandy Ballroom. Right. And uh, when those tapes were brought back and listened to by Albert and uh, the rest of the band, uh, you know, he said, well, you know, we can't fix this. You know, you're, all the mistakes that people are making are bleeding into the other's microphones, and, and it's, it's really tough. We can't really do much with this. And uh, I think he said that maybe in the next recording we'll get a, a studio drummer and a studio <laughs> bass player mm-hmm. and everybody looked at each other and go what yeah you fucking crazy yeah you know well you know that well, that did happen with a lot of bands back then too i mean even the beach boys you know they they yeah. did they did bring in the wrecking crew you know guys like that wrecking crew right right yeah. but when we played the uh monterey Folk Festival, I think it was. Uh, we just happened to play a, a very short set uh, of our regular rock and roll stuff. Uh, we preceded Theodore Pikel. And uh, uh, anyway, after that set, uh, Grossman and his wife, you know, wanted to talk to me and Dave backstage, and it was the same thing. You know, he said, "You guys just aren't." Aren't cutting it, you know. You're you're all over the rhythm. You speed up, you slow down, and uh, you know it, it was a precursor to uh, Janice leaving the band. Right, I'm sure. That's that's what he was setting us up for. Do, do you think you guys were kind of were, were, you guys were kind of headed towards like an improvisation type of a thing, kind of like uh, like a Mahavishnu type uh, band, you know, where you could go out there and do your own thing, and you know. No, actually, it, it, it kind of developed that way at the beginning. You know, we yeah. started doing doing some cover material, and then we started going into the more free, free form, right. uh, improvised uh, songs that would last like three, or four, or five minutes. Some things even longer. Yeah. Uh, when we got Janice, then it, it, we started pulling back, and we started doing songs that were four, three, maybe even two minutes long. Right. Um, stuff that would be good for a a record release uh, and radio play. So, um, you know, but we did always have a couple of songs that we would play during the sets that that went on and and featured improvisation. One of them was uh, Moondog's song called All Is Loneliness, Mm -hmm. which lasted about 10 minutes. Yeah. And it it featured a a choral kind of... uh, Round, and uh, then Janice would take off and, and improvise words and music, and uh, I played a solo. Sam played a solo. Dave played a solo. Yeah, it, uh, that was one of the uh, featured psychedelic songs, I guess, as it were. 
Well, see, that was the that was the difference in the '60s. You had bands. You had a lot of bands that were doing that improvisation thing and doing a lot of long songs. That would, I mean, that was the yeah. psychedelic period. It made sense. Yeah. But, but then you had the uh, record producers and record companies that wanted a commercial hit. So they wanted that, you know, very clean, short type of top 40 song, you know, which, which they I, probably wanted for Janice, I guess, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, a lot of producers, you know, didn't want those long improvised uh, instrumental solos. Uh, they, they just said, you know, uh, just it's cut to the chase. You know, right. the main thing is the lead vocal. You know, there's there's uh, you know some really good stuff in in that, and and then uh, take it out. You know, so anyway, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was never cut out to be a studio musician. Right. I, I still, you know, people will say, well, come, come on in the studio and, and try this, and, uh, uh, try a part out, you know, figure out something to play on. And I start figuring some doubt, and they said, no, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. I, I said, you, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> you, need to, you, need to, you need to talk to, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and there's so many good musicians here in the Bay Area yeah. that are that way, and you can call on them. You know? Right. Yeah, the the ironic thing, Janice leaves and Cheap Tri uh, Treat Thrills becomes number one. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. figure. I right, go figure. That was oh, a well. solid album, man. And and uh, you guys re-released it with the original title uh, a few years back, I think, right? A couple years back, yeah. The Sex Dope and Cheap Thrills. That's yeah. What it was supposed to be called. Yeah, that record. Uh, has a lot of uh, alternate takes on it, mm -hmm. and some songs that didn't make it to the cheap thrills. So it's really not not the same record. It's really totally different. Right. I mean, it's got uh, summertime, peace, peace of my heart, uh, ball and chain. Uh, you got Bill Graham featured on the album, right? Introducing the band. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess it was originally supposed to be a. Uh, Quadraphonic mix, right? I don't know about that. Uh, I, I don't think so, but uh, I could be wrong. It was, and the, the, uh, the original cover idea was supposed to be um, everybody naked in bed. Is that right? <laughs> oh, that, that, yeah, that's pretty rap. That didn't make it on the cover. So we like our our crumbs covered, you know. And, yeah. You know. Uh, Columbia, Clive Davis, and a couple other people, you know, changed some of the things on that cover, <laughs> but, but not much, you know. They, they just said, no, they take, take off the sex and don't, you know, just keep oh like, drilled. Oh, my God. It Dude, it's the 60s. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's crazy. And it's on Amazon now with the original title, and uh, I'm promoting it again. Because it's a great, oh, great. Yeah, it's a great album, and might as well do it right with the right, right title on it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you guys, what I understand, um, you grew up with a lot of guys, right? A few guys from the band, is that right? Well, not really. No. Uh, uh, <coughs> Sam, Sam came in early. Of course, he, Sam and, and I were the founding members of the band. There was a guy named Chuck Jones. Right. Who lived at Ten I Pay Street, and that's where where I live. That, that, okay. that quote that you had beginning there about Sam listening to music coming out of a out of an attic window, <laughs> third story window was yeah. it was a Ten I Pay Street, and that's a the uh, house that had a big ballroom that uh, Chet Helm used as a uh, um, kind of a jam session, a Wednesday night jam session, nineteen sixty five. So a lot of musicians from the from the Haight Ashbury would come in and, and play. A lot of them didn't have bass players, and some of them didn't even have drummers. So they would use you know, Chuck Jones and myself, and sometimes Sam would jam it. But we were like the the core of the of the uh, jam session. We would start out playing a couple of uh, cover songs, and then we'd have people jump in and and jam. And it, you know, Garcia was there, Big Ben, and right. Um, uh, David Ray. There's a whole bunch of people that that, that came out of that. And uh, about that time is when uh, uh, Marty Ballin started up uh, 
the Matrix Club on Fillmore Street, and mm-hmm. uh, close to the marina. A nice area of town, and uh, it was a uh, kind of a folk club at first, and then uh, it became more rock and roll. Of course, he he developed uh, uh, the uh, Jefferson Starship there. Right. I mean, I mean the Jefferson Airplane. Excuse me. Yep. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to, um, uh, like I said, I, I think I told you about earlier, I interviewed everybody from the uh, airplane except for Gray Slick. Um, right. Yeah, and uh, uh, great great band, uh, you know, nice guys. Uh, even Paul Katner, I, you know, I talked to Paul before he passed away. He was a good guy as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you got a chance to talk to those folks. Yeah. Uh, Marty lived in, in Florida, I guess, close to you. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, I was I was surprised when Marty passed away. You know, and, and, yeah, yeah and so full of life. Yeah, it was an odd, an odd thing. I, there was there's something about you know I I, I can't I can't uh, really discuss it because I don't know the details. But there was some problem with with uh, uh, um, a diagnosis. Really, uh, of throat cancer. Gosh. And he got the wrong medicine or something, or they didn't do enough. I don't know. But he, he was going to sue them, and then he died. That's scary. You know, it's scary as you approach the you know older age, and, and you see all these guys dying in their sixties and early seventies, and you know, yeah, it's it's terrible. Yeah. <clears throat> I uh, you know Yorma and Jack are from D.C. So when I right. had had them on, man, we talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Have you ever talked to Nils Lofgren? Yes. Nils is from Baltimore. Yeah. yeah. Originally from Baltimore. Yep. Nils is a we nice... We played a gig at Alexandria. Uh, we were second on the bill. I guess his band yep. led off the show and uh, uh, the Jeff Beck group closed the show. But when we're doing sound check, you know, Nils is such a nice guy. Mm-hmm. I say, can I, can I play with you guys in a little bit? I said, sure. <laughs> Yeah, Nils told me he was like a fly on the wall. He'd, he'd ask people, he'd go backstage and ask if he could just sit in, you know, backstage. And they said yes, and that's how he met Neil Young, I guess, you know, doing that. Well, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, he, I, I saw him quite, quite a few times when we'd go back east. You know, he'd, he'd uh, find out where we're playing and hang out. And, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. You guys played the Alexandria Roller Rink, if I, if I remember. Correctly, and uh, that's what it's called. Yeah, the that's roller rink. Which, yeah, yeah. And Nils, well, Nils is, several roller <laughs> rinks. I guess, music right. Yeah, well, that's all they had back then. There wasn't a lot of you know arenas or anything like that. It was it was hard to find a place with a lot of people. I guess you know gymnasiums. We played a lot of gyms, huh. and uh, we played like the Philadelphia Spectrum. Right. For example. Yeah. And you started, I guess, you were the house band at Avalon Ballroom, right? Yeah, basically. Since yeah. Uh, Chet was our manager and he was the head of the family dog who put on all those shows there at the Avalon. And uh, we did a lot of other other stuff outside of the Bay Area, but yeah, we were there almost like almost every weekend, it seemed like. You look at the posters, you right. know, we're, we're on a lot of the, the Avalon posters. Oh, great posters. You know, I mean, you can't you can't buy a psychedelic poster without saying "Big Brother" on it. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, F F V one, which is Family Dog Number One, is a tribal stop that was held at the Fillmore, and that right. was with Jefferson Airplane and ourselves. And that thing is worth if you could find the copy. It's like you know, three or four thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Th- those things are worth a lot of money now. Yeah. yeah. I don't even have a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I covered uh, the Happy Together tour, and uh, Mark Lindsay was there, you know, from Paul Revere and the Raiders. And my my uh, uh, sister-in-law, who passed away recently from cancer, uh, was a big fan of Paul Revere and the Raiders. She gave me her original albums. And I went and I talked to Mark, and I gave Mark those albums. He said, "Man, I don't even have these albums." You know, he was so happy oh. to get those albums. And, and what was not, what was very nice of him, he also talked to Mary on the phone. 
you know, she had cancer at the time, but they, they had a really nice conversation. He's a good, he's another good guy. You know, everybody from the sixties are cool. You know, <laughs> come on. That's the way, that's the way life should be. That's the way life should be now. There, there shouldn't be, <laughs> right? There shouldn't be anybody, you know, upset and sensitive and this and that, whatever. I mean, sixties, we all got along, man. <laughs> Francisco, you know, there there were a lot of groups, but uh, there were, uh, you know, five or six groups that seemed to play a lot. And there was a lot of a camaraderie, you know. We sure. We go eat to eat each other's, you know, rehearsal halls, check, check things out. And, and it really was, wasn't very competitive. The only thing I would say that was competitive with, with Big Brother was that we wanted a, a female vocalist because everybody else had female vocalists. So, exactly. Uh, uh, but it, it worked out quite well, and, and there's some there's some great pictures of Janice and Grace, for example, that, that Marshall mm -hmm. uh, took, and uh, Jim Marshall. Uh, he worked for uh, I can't remember what magazine it was, um, Teen Life or Sport Teen. I can't remember. Yeah, it was a lot of them. Uh, it's a great colored photograph of, of uh, Grace in her I think in her uh, Girl Scout uniform. Hmm. Janice and beads and feathers and stuff. Wow, she wore a, a Girl Scout uniform? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta see that. <laughs> yeah, it's out there at some place. You can probably find it on YouTube. Oh, I gotta look for that. I gotta look for that. There's an airplane site, yeah, funny. You were kind of like the Mike Love from the Beach Boys of uh, the band because you, you, you were the one who kind of... Um, you know, talked and would talk to everybody, and you're you're pretty very good at conversation and that kind of thing, right? You you kind of yeah. Well, pretty much, I didn't I didn't do a lot of drugs, so, uh, and I I felt that the uh, you know promotion by just talking to fans is, is the way to go. Yeah, you're awesome at it, you know, and that, that's how Mike Love did. Everybody else in the beach was were kind of quiet, and he t just kind of led the way, I guess, you know. <laughs> chance to talk to him or interview him? I did. I talked to Mike. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of during a period where he was kind of suing people. <laughs> oh. And he was kind of... period probably to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he was talking about so he didn't get credit for some of the songs and, and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that happens in every band. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I've, we've had problems sometimes, um, you know, uh, figuring out, uh, well, who wrote that dance song? Exactly. You know, to go back, yeah, try to remember and, and, and look at stuff that we've written down, whatever. But it, it, it's, it's not too difficult when the songs don't make a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. You know, you guys were the band, I think, in Monterey Pop. I mean, everybody, even to this day, when they... Talk about Monterey Pop, it's Janice and you guys, you know, performing on stage. Well, what was that uh, What was that like, that experience? Well, you know, first of all, I think the band at the Monterey Pop Festival was uh, Jimi Hendrix. Well, yeah, sure. Jimmy too. Yeah, Jimmy also. Well, they just blew everybody away. Yeah, you know? that's true. You know, we, we were kind of like some of the other San Francisco groups who, who had appeared there on Saturday during the afternoon. But um, Janice, of course, is, is, was was really special, and, and she sang the hell out of the big Mama May Thornton song, mm -hmm. Ball and Chain, which appears in the movie. Yep. But um, it was a, a fantastic event. When people ask me, you know, what show do I remember, or what event do I remember the best, you know, that was the best, and it has to be that. It was just such a great time, and uh, being around all those people, I mean, get, getting a chance to, to meet these people, um, Hendrix particularly, you know. Well, both, a, both Janice yeah. and Jimmy, you know, this is where you guys, you know, really came into their own at that time, you know. I mean, you both, both bands just blew everybody away at that time, you know, and, uh, you know, Jimmy started with the, uh, the fire and the guitar thing, but... That that wasn't really his style, you know. He really didn't. No. Yeah. No, he, uh, he he was really a dedicated guitar player, I, and, and he did these tricks, uh, you know, eating you know eating the guitar. I mean, playing guitar with his teeth, 
Yeah, uh, that's incredible. Um, and, you know, and some of it was really magic stuff, you know, tricky mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Was he actually playing with his teeth or, or, or was he just pulling off hard on the screen? Right, too? right. I guess we'll never um, know. <laughs> We'll never know because the guitar was not facing us. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you know Jimmy? A little bit. You know, yeah. after after the uh, Monterey Pop Festival, he played us to San Francisco and was on the bill with Jefferson Airplane at the Fillmore. And 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 the usual gigs were Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, Thursday, the airplane had some other gig they had to do, so we replaced them um, and we, we became one of the opening acts I believe and Hendrix became the, uh, the headliner which he wasn't on Friday, Saturday and Sunday he was the second or third on the film right. uh, so uh, he comes to the film and, and we're in the dressing room area uh, and he only had a couple of dressing rooms upstairs it was very small and he said, well, where's the beer? <laughs> and I said, well, Jimmy, they, this is, this is a, a, a family type place. I mean, kids can come here. Uh -huh. So they, they don't have a liquor license. So, well, I, I always have beer in the dressing room where I play. <laughs> I said, well, do you want to go get some? He said, yeah. I said, I'll take it. So we went down the, the stairs to the street, walked down a couple of blocks to the Safeway store. He bought a couple of six packs, you know. <laughs> the funny thing was that, you know, that's a, an African American neighborhood, a film industry. Right. And a lot of these older folks were looking at him askance, as they say, or in amazement because of what he was wearing, which was like, oh, yeah. You know, some sort of military thing with epaulettes and lots of beads hanging down. And, uh, uh, you know, and an afro, you know, this like early on. Yeah. Was like, you know, 67. So, uh, they go, whoa, who's that dude, you know? <laughs> so we come back to the film one and they, she drinks his beer. But uh, that's, that's my Jimi Hendrix beer story. But you know, <laughs> David had a story about him. But he, at, the, at the Monterey Pop Festival, there were some jam sessions that went on in different, on different stages that were like for free. Outdoor stuff, um, same as the, as the main, but you know, no chairs, just a little stage, and people would just, you know, there were some amplifiers set up and a drum set set up, and Hendrix was playing, you know, and, and uh, Dave got set, sat in, and he said, some guy came up to, to Hendrix and had a couple of pills, and Hendrix just stuck out his, his tongue as he was playing guitar, and mm. I stuck a couple of LSD tabs on his tongue. Wow, wow, oh. jeez. <laughs> You know, you know, I had a friend. I, I had a friend like that in high school. I mean, somebody would give him like twenty pills. He just put it in his mouth. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. Wow. I can't figure that out. <laughs> yeah. No way, man. No well, way. <laughs> what? What? I this old, old uh, black drummer who who had been through the jazz scene, you know, and the way that he would get stoned, he, he would take a tab of acid. And he said, "Man, he's got to take it up." He said, Every once in a while, I just lick this thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you get moderately high, you know. But uh, for me, yeah. LSD was, uh, you know, not 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 the drug for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I only had two trips, and the second trip, I wound up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other story, Jennifer Ray. Well, put that in your autobiography. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, jeez. Well, Mark Farner says the word, the the the, um, the strongest acid. You know, he wasn't. He, he didn't do a lot of acid really, but when he did, he did with Jimi Hendrix, and he says that. I mean, I think he was gone for three days or four days. He didn't know what was going on, and uh, that kind of it, it was it was the worst experience he ever had because he had such strong acid at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh man! It was probably Owsley acid. Yeah, I mean, I purple they, haze, purple haze, uh, microdot, window pane. These are these are names I remember okay. from high school. <laughs> Orange flash, all, all yeah. sorts of different things. You know. Yeah. There's a famous poster called the Tripper Freak poster, mm -hmm. and it was with it was a Halloween gig at the uh, Winterland. 
Right. Uh, and it was with us, Grateful Dead and Quicksilver. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that, yeah. So some of the people dressed up and whatever in costumes. It was a fun night. But the poster itself has little pictures of Lon Chaney in the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, that's, that's a and, scary, scary and, photo. Uh, some, some people took the poster, yeah. some of the acid people, and they would cut uh, a... They, uh, I'm not sure exactly how they did it, but anyway, they, they cut out all the little pictures of Lon Chaney and they dosed it with acid or coated oh, gosh. it or soaked it. Yeah. So that poster is worth quite a bit if you can find mm. one. That, that, that picture of Lon Chaney, the fo- you know, that scared the shit out of me, man. <laughs> yeah, that's you a know? fucking picture. You know? you know how he did that? Was he used like uh, paper clips or something in his nose. Really? Make his nose elongated, yeah. And then, and then makeup, of course. Weird. That scared the crap out of me. I, I read something at, on Wikipedia, and I don't know, you know, Wikipedia, you know, sometimes it's really good, sometimes, you know, and I, and I always ask the performers, is this true? But did you guys, um, you were going to reform the band, okay? You, you had left uh, Country Joe, and you were going to reform the band. Was, was one of the auditions, was that Eddie Money? Is that true? That's what someone said. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember that. I, okay. I mean, I never saw any money. I mean, he never came to a, an audition, but someone said that he was trying to get a hold of us. Right. And and wanted to talk to us about it, but huh. I, I never did. Yeah, because I know he was a cop at one time in his career. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And someone mentioned mentions Patty Smith also. Really? Patty but, Smith, but, huh. That's interesting. Um, huh? Yeah. She went, what, she went to take well, the... That was, uh, that was a real tough time for us. Like, after we got back uh, mm-hmm. trying to get the band back together. Right. Uh, well, actually, before Dave and I went off with Country Joe and the Fish to Europe for two months, we were doing some auditions of various people, and the, the basic band was uh, David Nelson on guitar, myself on guitar, mm-hmm. David Torbert on bass, and Dave Getz on on drums. Right. It was like the new riders and big meets big brother. But it was before the new riders. Hmm. And uh, we we auditioned a couple different people. Buzzy Faken, that was a great guitar player, I think. Buzzy, uh, Bugsy Mon was mm-hmm. going to play bass and I was going to continue playing guitar. Um, gosh, there's a couple other people that were suggested by the uh, uh, Albert Grossman Association or management group. Um, they were trying to help us, but not not really, you know. Uh, they wanted us actually to uh, be produced by Todd Rundgren. Yep, I, I've had Todd on the show several times. Yeah. yeah. Good producer, you know. Yeah. Good I, everything. I haven't talked to him in a long time. But, yeah, uh, good everything. He's, Todd, Todd's great. He, what he does, he does he's everything. He's done a lot of stuff. Yeah. At that time, though, we knew him as the guitar player for the Naz. The Naz, yeah. That's a long time ago. Yeah. I think it was way back, yeah. Way back when. We played with him at the Arizona Ballroom in Chicago. Yep. In 67. Anyway, um, or 68. Anyway, there was there was a lot of uh, uh, thoughts about what we should do. And, and, and we, we started auditioning some uh, female vocalists. And, and then other stuff came up, and uh, um, when we went, when Dave and I went off with Country Joe, that that whole thing with David Nelson, David Torbert just fell apart, and they 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 started the um, uh, new writers <coughs> during that time. When we came back, uh, Sam had had been fired mm-hmm. by Janice uh, from the Cosmic Blues Band, right. And and uh, James Gurley had uh, come back from the desert. You know, he he went on this long trip, and, and unfortunately, his his uh, wife uh, died of an overdose during oh, that God. trip, and uh, it kind of set him off. He wanted to get back down and, and make some money, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it was kind of tough for us to get back together. But we did, and we we recorded two. Albums to be a brother mm-hmm. album and uh, how hard it is. Yeah, 
You, you know who would have been a great fit after after Janice? She wasn't even born at the time, but Beth Hart. Uh, yeah. I love Beth Hart, man. She's to me, she's the the uh, the next best singer after Janice. You know, I mean, she's incredible in that style. In that style, right? Yeah. Yeah, she's incredible. She played Janice, I think, on on Off Broadway. In that, I think uh, she did. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, she's a great blues singer, and she's you know she's she's been playing with a lot of people, Bonamassa, Jeff Beck. A lot of, I had her on the show. She's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about the dinosaurs, man. That's a, what a group. Uh, why aren't you guys? What happened there? I mean, you got everybody was in that band. <laughs> you know. Well, it was definitely a jam, a jam band. Although uh, uh, the leader was, was basically Barry Melton. Right. We did a lot of his his material. <clears throat> we did a couple of my songs. We did a couple of uh, uh, Chipolina's songs and uh, Merle Saunders also. Um, and it, early on, we had uh, Bob Hunter. I think it was just for for about a year that we had him, and, yeah. and we did a couple of his tunes also. Um, and I say, you know, it was fun, but we didn't work that much. Maybe ten gigs a year. Uh huh. But it lasted a while, you know. I, I guess it lasted a while. Yeah, you guys started, I think, around '82, uh, which was a tough time for music, really. I mean, you know, you didn't have a lot of rock, you know, rock bands that were doing other things, you know, like Kenny Rogers and Donna Summers and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, uh, then you lasted through the '90s, you know, which was uh, well. Actually, the the band started breaking up when people started dying. Really? God. Uh, I hate when that happens. With, with, with <laughs> and um, he was replaced by uh, uh, Papa John Creech. Right, right. Uh, who also lasted a while uh, with, with us and then he went on back on his own again and he passed away. Yeah. We had Bobby Fleury from, from Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. He was a great player. Yep. Um, got a lot of people just uh, jammed with us at Northern Buffalo. And, uh, um, uh, gosh, just a, a ton of people from the Bay Area mostly. Yeah, you know, Nicky Hopkins at one time, right? Jack Cassidy? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Huh. I guess you guys were close to Quicksilver Messenger Service. I guess they were like uh, buddies of yours. That was a great band. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I'd known uh, David Freiberg from mm -hmm. uh, uh, the old folk music days. Mm -hmm. He had a, a, a duo called uh, David and Mike Hella. Yeah. And they played, uh, you know, ballads and things like that. But uh, when Big Brother was getting it together in 65, uh, someone contacted our um, uh manager at the time it wasn't Chet Helms it was uh, Paul Sanchez I think his name was Paul Farraz that's what it was and uh, Paul said these two guys are from Fresno and, and they're for set or something and they, they're, they're looking for a, a bass player you, know, you want to come with me and you know talk to these guys and it was uh, um, Belmore and, and uh, uh, Duncan hmm. and I said no I, we played a little couple of things and It's different, huh? Yeah. Who who, uh, who who came up with Big Brother, the Big Brother and the Holding Company? Who came up with that yeah, name? We just started. We started writing down all these goofy names mm -hmm. on different uh, pieces of paper. You know, there's two pe two pieces of paper, two different lists, and and someone said, "Well, why don't we join that Holding Company with the Big Brother and Big Brother and Holding Company?" That sounds kind of interesting. Right. Just the way it flows out of your mouth. Yep. Uh, and it's goofy. You know, it's got a couple of differences. Sure. Yeah, it's cool. And yeah. then the holding company, you're holding, you know, mm -hmm. uh, something, you know, um, and it's probably weed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, people like that sort of thing at the time. Um, yeah, it's just kind of goofy. Yeah. Today it sounds like a, a big corporation. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
Exactly. <laughs> I want to mention. Some people would say, "Oh, Big Brother is Chet Helms." When they would see a photograph, of right? Him. And sometimes photographs would contain other people. You know, and Chet mm-hmm. sometimes was in these photographs. So. I want to mention they called uh, Janice Big Brother. Oh, Janice is Big Brother. Yeah, yeah. You know? I want to mention Dinosaurs did put out um, a studio album in 1988. Right. Everybody needs to buy that. Uh, it's probably going to be worth a lot of money one day, or it probably is already. Uh, and also, uh, Friends of Extinction, Extinction, which is a retrospect of the album, which w- was was released as well. And right. CD, yeah. Yeah, and here, here's a side note. This is kind of neat. The band Dinosaur Jr. had us put the Jr. on it because of you guys, because you know, there was already a dinosaurs out there. So right, well, yeah, Milton <laughs> was an, an attorney, and still is an attorney, uh-huh. and he sent them like a cease and desist order, you know, you can't use our name. But what are we going to do? Well, why don't you just change your name to Giant Dinosaur Jr., <laughs> something like that, or Giant yes. Dinosaur the Second. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're pissed off. That's interesting. I, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, the lead guitar player. but Right. Yeah, he was he was not happy. I got, uh, and, I, you know, it's funny. They came. He came with his group to uh-huh. the San Francisco at one point. And I said, "We got to get down to that gig, Barry." You know, <laughs> and you have to get on stage with this guy. And you know, so we're we're, we're musicians the same, you know, and mm. uh, there shouldn't be any hostilities. I, I got to ask you, where were you when Janice passed away, and and what were your immediate feelings when that happened? Well, I was at home. I was I was watching a W. C. Fields movie of all things. Really? And I get this call from our our road roadies uh, uh, saying that Janice had passed away, and and uh, you know I didn't break down and cry and whatever. You know, some of the other guys in the band did, but mm-hmm. I. I, I thought, you know, all along, this, this is not going to turn out well. Right. For what she's been doing, she, but she was going back and forth between, you know, extended periods of time drinking, then stopping, and and, and shooting heroin. Oh, jeez. And, and then she said, no, I can't do this anymore. She stopped shooting heroin, and then she still went back to drinking. And yeah. it just kept going back and forth. And uh, man, oh man, it was, you know, it, it, to me, it was like inevitable. You know, she was just burning the candle at three ends if there was such a thing. What well, I understand, she got a really strong batch of heroin that night. You know, I... Yeah, it's yeah. difficult to... You know, I, I've heard many stories, so yeah. it's difficult to figure out exactly what happened. Mm. Um, I think the... the um, oh, gosh. I think it's in... in, in uh, John Cook's book. I think he's, he yeah. has a pretty good description of what of what happened and what he thought happened. It, it sort of somehow involved, and uh, she doesn't seem to, to be in the books. I think that she is trying to write another book. You know, she wrote right. a book going down with Janice. You know, right? It's basically a kind of a, a lesbian take on, on the relationship between hmm. her and, uh, and Janice. Um, and it's not well written. That book is yeah. really almost like kind of sick. Oh, um, I hate those kind I of think books. The best, the best yeah. book is probably the the, uh, uh, the last the last one done by uh, probably George Warren. Well, you guys, the, the, the special you guys did was probably the best I've ever seen. You know, the, the uh, that that was incredible. We, the Michael Sporka book? Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the the one I saw, I mean, I think I first saw it on YouTube, where it's the whole, you know, it, a, a lot of it was you talking about it, and then he, uh, you know, it was just the events, all the events that happened, and right. the way you guys were in the, the house together, and, you know, the, the camaraderie, and, and the, the whole story, basically, yeah. in a nutshell, you know? Yeah, that's a good one, but if, if someone's really interested in Janice, I mean, there's several good out mm-hmm. there, Very Alive, mm-hmm. um, by Myra Friedman is probably 
the first one I would suggest. And then there's the one that was written by her sister called Love Janice, which which contains a lot of letters mm -hmm. um, written by Janice to her family and to her brother and sister. Yeah. Um, the only problem I see with, with the letters is that, you know, Janice wouldn't write a letter to her, her, her brother or sister or her mother and father uh, mentioning uh, a couple of drug overdoses and an abortion in Mexico. Wow. Which happened. Hmm. So, you know, there's still a lot of stuff out there. So there are some people who are interested in making, doing a dramatic film, a take, a dramatic take on Janice's story. Yeah. And so David and I are kind of involved with someone who evidently has gotten some good money and sponsorship to, mm -hmm. to make a, a dramatic movie about Janice. The only problem that I see, though, is that, you know, uh, even though there's a lot of sadness, a lot of tragedy, Janice was a funny person. Right. She, you know, you know, you could really get her to, to laugh. It was almost like a cackle. But she'd do it all the time because she was having fun. And she was getting off. You see, know? see and, they, uh, they need to focus on that. A, a different side of Janice, the, the the real side, and that harp on the on the horrible stuff, you know, and, and that's what Hollywood yeah. does. They always, of course, harp on the ho the bad stuff, and they shouldn't, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, there's a couple of stories that Dave and I are kind of saving for this. Well, one of the, one of these days, the movie that will come out mm -hmm. that'll be uh, really a good a good movie about Janice, not some bullshit stuff. I mean, it does in a couple of documentaries. That the the best one is Little Girl Blue, Janice Joplin, Little Girl Blue. Right. And um, uh, that was done by a gal who spent seven years, I mm -hmm. mean, going over all the old footage that she could gather yep. and license and um, did a lot of interviews. And did a, uh, interviews with people who are no longer around, yeah. including John, John Cook, San Andrew, I think she might even have some stuff from Linda Gravenitis, who, who is Janice's uh, 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 seamstress. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah they, anyway. need, they need to talk to Dick Cavett before he passes away, too, because I think that was yeah. that was her favorite, uh, I guess, talk show host or, or whatever. Yeah. Oh, uh, she liked Dick, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's a question I ask everybody. Uh, I get some okay. interest. I get some interesting answers, and ironically, it's about Field of Dreams, and they're playing a game tonight uh, at the Field of Dreams uh, place, the Yankees and the uh, White Sox. First game at Field of Dreams. Uh, if wow. you, yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> it is cool. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? back a lot of these people I didn't yep. have enough time you know yeah spend with them like like uh, uh, Otis Redding and yep. Jimi Hendrix and, uh, um, you know uh, let's see who else I, I would have loved to have uh, met and played with uh, Fats Domino mm -hmm. that's uh, a good one and uh I played in the same bill with Chuck Berry, and he was kind of a weird dude, so I'm not sure if I'd bring him back. <laughs> it's, it's like that character, what? Is it, uh, um, oh, God, the guy in the Field of Dreams that they said, they, they, oh, no, we don't want him to, him to come. Yeah, Ty so, Cobb. <laughs> Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so Chuck Berry is kind of like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but there's just a, uh, who else would I, would I bring back? Um, I've never met uh, uh, Little Richard, although we played in the same bill with him, but we had to leave early. And right. I would have liked to have, have talked with him and, and maybe played a little bass behind him. That would have been fun. Yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he, he was like one of my major influences when I first oh, he started was a, he was to a play the rock and roll music. Yeah. Did, did you did you did you meet any of the Beatles? I met Paul mm -hmm. uh, because we knew his wife Linda. Right. Linda had uh, 
uh, been a photographer uh, for uh, a book called Rock and Other Four Letter Words. And it's just filled with her photos. It's really it's a good book. But she came out with her own book. And uh, we got a chance to uh, uh, go down to L.A. where she was uh, doing some sort of uh, signing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, actually, she wasn't doing a signing. It was a photographic exhibit, I think, of her work. And there was a lot of people there, uh, a lot of notables, I guess you'd call them. And uh, so we got a chance to talk to her a little bit, and her husband came in, so I had him sign this book, too. Flashing on the 60s, that's what it's called. That's a good book. Um, but anyway, I, would, I wouldn't mind playing with uh, some of those guys. I like to, I like to play bass behind uh, Richard Starkey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and he's still out there with his uh, all-star band. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people I'd, uh, I'd love to uh, just, you know, see together, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the jazz guys. Yep. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, it's not it, as, a, as a tight team as I, I think you were looking for. But <laughs> <laughs> No, those are good answers. I, I don't get uh, Fat Domino too much, you know. We always get a lot of the Beatles, of course, and uh, Hendrix, and uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now what's going on with Big Brother and the Holding Company now? I mean, uh, are you guys, I, I saw something coming up. I don't know if it was yeah, in September. We've got, we got several gigs coming up. I wanted to make sure that I... I'm accurate about this. But okay. The problem is I don't have the venue names for a lot of these just the names of the towns. Is it on so your... In September, okay. we're playing at uh, Wolf's Bar, Pennsylvania on right. September 18th. Okay. And I believe that's with um, <coughs> uh, the Yardbirds, but I'm not sure. And then we're playing on the 25th of September in St. Charles, Illinois. Mm -hmm. I think that's south of Chicago. Um, on the 27th, we're going to be in Sellersville at the Sellersville Theater in Pennsylvania. And that's a great venue. We've played right. that several times. They're wonderful people, and it's a sit-down kind of thing. But there's some area where you can dance if you want to. Uh, and then on the 29th and the 30th, we'll be in Springfield, Massachusetts, playing what's called the Big E. Mm -hmm. Evidently, that's some sort of an amusement park area, oh. something like that. And that's it. Uh, we were going to be going to uh, Holland in October, but it, that has been postponed right. in February. Yeah, I could see you guys touring overseas a lot because the, you know the, they they are starving for entertainment, especially the '60s guys. And I mean, they they really appreciate it. You know, when you guys come over, yeah. There, yeah. I've I've got the um, I've got the the uh, in front of me. I've got the FM Kirby Center at Wilkes Bar. '60s. Okay. It's, it's a '60s spectacular. It's got the yard birds. I've had I've had Jim McCarty on the show. Nice guy. Really nice okay. guy. Big Brother and the Holding Company, and Peter Asher and Jeremy Clyde. Wow, that's a right. that's a hell of a show, man. <laughs> yeah, you know. I think we're probably the the uh, the leadoff act. I think, uh, but uh, regardless, uh, you know, I hope everybody you know uh, takes a look at either our website. I think that's what uh, what you're on, maybe, or I'm on your website. Um, yes, I'm on your website. Okay. Yep. And I figured that a lot of times on our website we'll have you know the sites of the of the venues, so you can go and get tickets and and uh, get uh, uh, information about where you know the addresses and times. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you guys are out there again, you know, because there's a long law there for concerts, you know, and uh, you guys need to be out yeah. there. Um, I want to mention as well. Let's see if I can find it here. Oh, uh, crap. Okay, I was going to name... Okay, we got Peter Alvin on bass. You've been with the band since 1965. Dave Getz, right, on drums. 
Right. Uh, and piano, he's been with the band since 66. Tom Finch is on guitars. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Darby Gould on uh, lead vocals. I think in this particular case, it's going to be Sophia Ramos from New York City. Sophia Ramos, okay. And then make a note of that. And, and the second guitarist is uh, David Aguilar. David, yeah, David Aguilar, right. He's been there since 2018, I guess. Yep. Yeah, he's one of our newer, newer guys. And, and we work with Sophia off and on, usually when we're back east. Right. Awesome, and that's, that's the current uh, band that's going to be touring. Yeah. yeah, in the East. Now, when we play here in the West Coast, we use Darby Gould, okay. who has played, you know, uh, with right. the Deception Starship and lots of other bands. Exactly. And she's excellent singer, too. Huh. Well, we're definitely looking forward to more uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company in concert. Uh, is, is, is By it... the way, Ray, before I, I forget, uh, we use a wonderful singer that's in your area, or at least in the Tampa Bay area, and that's Ivy Humphreys. Okay. She's an excellent uh, singer, and, uh -huh. and we've used her in Europe a couple of times. You know, we have a local. We, once. we have a local singer here. Would be perfect in your band. Her name is Twinkle. I don't know if you heard of her or not, but she's she's no, yeah she's local here. She's incredible, and she does a lot of the okay. '60s stuff. So, uh, if you're ever in this area, maybe I we I can hook you guys up together to you know. You can meet her or whatever, but she's she's been around a what, while. What, what town are you in there, Ray? I'm in this the uh, Sarasota Bradenton area, okay. and uh, we're about okay. know, about thirty five minutes uh, south of Tampa. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, the Ringling Brothers. Y yep. Uh, isn't that isn't there a museum there for the Ringling Brothers or something? Oh yeah, it's right. It, yeah, it's five minutes from me. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, Ringling Brothers. Was in, <laughs> this is where the Ringling Brothers that came. Area, yeah. Yeah. South of that too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And in uh, St. Pete, we got the Dolly Museum. <laughs> All about <Wow>. Salvador Dolly. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, I hope well, you guys come to Florida too. To several times. We're going to have to get our uh, our uh, agent to, to look up some more gates down there. Yeah. We, exactly. We did a flower power cruise out, out of. Right, right. Puerto Rico. Yeah, those are fun. Those cruises are fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Peter, I want to thank you, man, for being on the show today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, we, we, yeah, it's my pleasure, Ray. It's been yeah, fun. It's been a lot of fun, you know. Uh, like I said, you guys are all my heroes growing up. And uh, when I, anytime I get to do this, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big thrill for me. Yeah. And, oh, that's uh, great. And if anybody who's listening is going to come to his gigs, you know, yep. please, uh, uh, come and see us and say hi. Oh, definitely. And to meet your audience. <laughs> definitely. I hope you come to Florida. Uh, kind of add, t tell your booking guy to add Florida. <laughs> yep. In the yep. future. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, we'll keep that in mind. All right, Peter. Take care, man. Take care of those birds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ray. Nice to talk with you. All right. We'll talk to you later. All, All the right. best. Bye bye now. All right. All right. Bye bye. Purchase Big Brother and the Holding Company, Cheap Thrills, Janet, Janet Joplin's uh, breakout album, and her final one with the band, reissued on Columbia Legacy Records, uh, part of the 50th anniversary set, which was released under the title Sex, Dope, and Cheap Thrills, which Columbia considered too controversial in 1968 go figure it's available at amazon.com probably the best album they ever put out for more information about peter alban and big brother in the holding company visit www.bbhc.com they're on facebook uh www.facebook.com backslash bbhc band they're also on twitter if you have comments or suggestions for the show, you can always contact me at interviewingthelegends@gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho for the very latest interviews. It is real news, people. And of course, please, please, please buy my best-selling book, The Rockstar Chronicles Series 1. It's great, guys. Chronicles, truths, confessions, and wisdom from the music legends 
that set us all free. You can order yours today on the Collector's Edition hardcover. Uh, you can get it on ebook, and it's available at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Featuring over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends the world will ever know, and many of them have unfortunately passed on. Uh, it, the literary Titan gave it a five-star review. It's a great book, and I'm not just saying that. Thank you for listening. You guys stay safe. Uh, have fun out there as much as you can, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.